Good morning, church. It is really good to be with you this morning. I'm thankful for 39 degrees and no snow. A couple Sundays ago, it was not that way, and you get a little nervous when you try to get out uh, in the wintertime. Um, but uh, it's a blessed day uh, because it's the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Uh, so this morning, I, I just want to start with a heartfelt thanks for uh, the heart that you share with Midwestern Children's Home as we try to uh, meet the needs of some young people who uh, have, have some tragedy in their life, some trauma, uh, some, some hardships and uh, struggling their way through uh, trying to find uh, bigger answers for life. So thank you for joining us in that effort. Uh, you brought Christmas gifts to us um, and brought the joy of Christmas morning and we're thankful for that. Uh, you know, as, as we serve kids on a continual basis, it's interesting to serve them from, we'll say, Christmas Day to um, like a Mother's Day to a snow day where our house parents get to spend the whole entire day with them because there's no school that day. Uh, and you brought joy that morning, a Christmas morning, to our children, uh, and we're thankful for the support that you give uh, on an ongoing basis. If you don't know, there's money that comes out of, of your budget that, that comes to us monthly, and we're so thankful for your faithfulness in that. Uh, and if there's anyone here that, that is supporting us monthly financially in your own, out of your own personal uh, monies, we, we say thank you for that. Uh, I have to assume that sitting in, in this audience is maybe people that have never heard of Midwestern Children's Home before. And so real quickly, I just want to give you an overview of, of what is it that Midwestern Children's Home is? What do we do? Uh, and a long time ago, uh, a mission was set out by, by men and women of the Churches of Christ to create a home, to create a home where the downtrodden, where the, those that were struggling uh, could be taken care of, and that through their stay at a place called Midwestern Children's Home, they can not only be fed and clothed, which Jesus talks about with the least of these, uh, but they could learn the beauty of God's kingdom. They could learn more of who Jesus is uh, and the, uh, the opportunity to make him Lord and Savior of their lives. And so as we continue 50-some-odd uh, years later with that calling, that's exactly what we're doing, is we're opening up our doors to young people. They're primarily teenagers uh, that are coming to us for a variety of different reasons because uh, they, they need a home. They need a safe place. Uh, they need to be loved like they haven't been loved possibly before. Uh, and, and our house parents, our staff, uh, brings them in, welcomes them in, uh, and, and gives them, again, the food and clothing they need, but so much more than that. Uh, and so you join us in that effort to show God's love uh, to the hurting, uh, to those that, that need extra care at this time in their life, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we have a house parent model. And uh, that means we have a family that comes in and lives in each unit, and they serve those kids 24-7, 365. Well, that's not quite true. They get some time off. Uh, they get a weekend a month, and they get some vacation time. Uh, but they have a heart to come in and, and serve children with that mindset. And uh, the good news is I stand before you, if this works. I don't know if this is. Or, oh, wait, you've got to turn it on. That makes everything work better when you turn something on. Um, we have openings for house parents, and so if you'd ever think or thought about the calling of uh, really opening up your hearts, opening up your time, your lives to the service of children in need, um, I'm here really honestly to plant a seed. Maybe you've thought about it for years and you're ready to talk more seriously to me about this or with me about this, uh, but maybe you've just thought one day I might do that. And I'd love to have that conversation with you about one day that you might uh, come and consider uh, serving our kids as house parents. Uh, right now we're running two boy houses and two girl houses. Uh, in the big picture of life, we'd like to be running three girl houses and three boy houses. Um, and of course we have, we, we have the genders not mixed in the same cottage. That's a little too, cottages aren't big enough or built for that. 
so if you would have a desire to serve boys or girls right now, we have the opportunity for, for either with that mindset uh, going forward. And, and I'd love to talk to you about that again, just to plant a seed if, if maybe it would ever happen. Um, we appreciate again, as I talked about your ongoing support, uh, 2022 was a difficult year. Uh, if you haven't seen, grocery prices have gone up a little bit. Maybe you're aware of that. I heard recently eggs were costing some ridiculous amount of money for a, a dozen eggs. Um, and our teenagers can go through a dozen eggs. Let me just sh share that, that, that message with you. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, and truly, the support that we get from individuals and churches, they allow us to truly serve the kids that come our way. Uh, we are the only home in the state of Ohio that will work with families in need of, of care, of out-of-home care, regardless of their ability to pay. And so the money that we raise, the fundraising that we are about, uh, is truly so that when that family comes calling, uh, that we can say yes to them. And I would even say if you have a family, for whatever reason, they're struggling with their teenager in your community, uh, they, Midwestern Children's Home could be of help to them. Uh, that they, you know, we're closer to Cincinnati, we're closer to Kings Island, uh, but we've served families from all over uh, Ohio, literally. We've also served families from like Kentucky and Indiana and West Virginia um, uh, as they were in need of services. Um, there are just times when families are struggling with things, when children are serving, struggling with things, that counseling's not enough. Uh, and sometimes a larger intervention needs to be put in place like Midwestern Children's Home. Um, and if that means we serve the person that uh, doesn't have to go do something violent at school and we prevent that from happening, then we feel blessed when we get to do that. If that means that we help someone who struggles with mental health issues, uh, a young person, and we get them back to a state of health to where they can manage in their own family better, then we want to be there for them. Uh, and so there are families in need. The family is still struggling in America, and, and uh, we, we are a place that can help them. And, and I will tell you that the need is there. We've had uh, four children placed in the last few weeks with us. Uh, and we don't always get four children in like four weeks, uh, but the need is there. Uh, and we've, we've, we've uh, had the opportunity to, to welcome them into our care. Uh, I'll also talk to you about a cottage expansion project that's going on. Our houses were built primarily in from 1967 to 1969. Um, and you may live in a house that that's old, that is that old, but uh, you know that we have a different mindset towards floor plans and how much space people need as we would build a house per se in 2023. Our houses are still in excellent condition and there's no reason to tear them down and start over. Uh, but like the laundry's in the basement, most people don't want to do the, especially the amount of laundry we do, walking up and down all those stairs all the time. Uh, they really were not built with a, a den, an, an, an activity space for the kids. Uh, and uh, there's some other needs that were met. So we're looking as we go into 2023 to really truly begin a work towards expanding our ranch style cottages with, with a, like an 1100 square foot den that has different aspects of it that will make our houses more livable for the kids we serve uh, and give our house parents more space as they serve them. Uh, it's probably going to be about $150,000 per cottage for us to go into that. Uh, and so if you just have $150,000 laying around that you don't know what to do with, please talk to me afterwards. I'd love to have that conversation. Uh, thankfully, building costs are coming down. I heard this week from our builder that, that OSB went from 40 bucks a sheet to 8 bucks a sheet. So we're feeling like maybe this is a time to embark on this. Um, and so we're, we're looking for people that could, could join us in that. Uh, and if you have a heart towards that or you have some thoughts about how you might could help along those lines, we'd appreciate that. And I would say the last thing before I get into our lesson this morning from God's Word, um, you know, uh, fundraising is an ever-increasing need uh, as we go from year to year, as inflation comes around. Uh, and so we realize that we need to expand our fundraising staff. Uh, and so we're in the process of looking for a development uh, a donor relation position. Uh, if you know of anybody that would have a heart for joining our ministry full time, uh, reaching out to the churches to help us uh, spread the word, connect better. Uh, if you know of anybody that might have an interest in that, I'd love to, to talk to you or them uh, about the, 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 the possibility of that opening. Um, 
And uh, again, just thankful for uh, your support uh, and all that, that you do for us. Uh, this morning's lesson, I'm going to come out of Philippians chapter 4. Uh, you can turn there. Um, I'm actually only going to cover about three verses, if that doesn't scare you, so maybe I won't preach too long. Uh, but as I come to this, I want to ask you, uh, have you ever been angry at God? Um, this is something we actually talked about at the, the summer camp that I was a part of this past summer with some teenagers. And I asked them, have you ever been angry at God? And these are, you know, teenagers, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. And about 80% of them raised their hand. And these are the kids going to church camp. Don't know all their stories, don't know where they're at, but they've already experienced some times they've been angry at God. And I can tell you that the children we serve at Midwestern Children's Home come to us angry and confused. And when we start talking to them about faith, about God, about the love of Jesus, uh, they have some struggles with that. Uh, through the years, I can say that I've had conversations with kids and they're really struggling with, if God is such a loving God, then why was I treated the way that I was treated by a parent or an adult or a, a family member or a teacher and the abuse that they struggled from them? And through the years, I, I've come to an understanding of, you know what, if, if God brought them to Midwestern Children's Home, and that has always been our prayer as that with, with we walk in faith as a ministry, that God bring us the children that need your love in this place. And if we go out of business one day because there's no children that need that, that families are so healthy, that's a good thing. Uh, but we pray that prayer often. And as I've sat down with those children, and I've had, you know, we've had these conversations about faith and God and Jesus, and they're like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about that. Why would God let that happen? And, I, and I'm like, well, you're here. God brought you here, I believe. They, they might struggle with that. And I said, did you ever remember a night, a time when you thought that was going to be the end? Maybe you were hiding in a closet. Maybe you were hiding under the bed. Maybe you just went to the other room and you just hoped the bad thing wouldn't happen again tonight, whatever that bad thing was. And they're like, yeah. And, I did, and you really felt like that was going to be it. There was no surviving that night. And they're like, yeah, I can tell you a story about that night. And I'd say, well, then I would say, you're here. God did deliver you through that night. God did give you an answer. He did make a way. Uh, and then they're like, oh, I've not thought of it like that. But they've got some struggles that they've got to come through. But I don't believe it's just them. I think we all at times deal with hard things in life. People that I know have lost jobs. People that I know have unfortunately experienced divorce. Whether that's from the, the, being the, the wife or the husband or the kids. Uh, people have experienced all kinds of things. Uh, with with the, the pandemic that has gone through. Uh, we've, we've had people who had seemingly many years of life left on this earth. And that was cut short. Uh, and they aren't with us on this earth anymore. And there are times we've got to have those feelings of, of uncertainty, of even anger. And so the idea, have you ever been angry with God? What then? What then? So Philippians 4, um, verse 4 starts out and says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The NIV says, do not be anxious about anything. Are you successful at that? I struggle, I'll admit. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to live in that kind of faith, but I struggle with that a little bit. Um, and I, and I've, I've grown up with the New American Standard Bible. That's what my parents kind of introduced to me. And I've read the ESV and I've read the NIV. And there's always this thought of, do not be anxious about anything. And that makes sense to me a little bit, except it's a challenge. It's not something that comes naturally to me. It calls me to a deeper level of faith than I might be uh, experiencing otherwise. And so... 
Uh, but as I did some research on this, the King James Version says it a little bit differently. It says, be careful for nothing. I have no idea what that means. And if you know what that means, be careful for nothing. If you have a great thing out on that, please let me know. But that really, be careful for nothing. Those words just doesn't, don't make sense to me. And so as I was doing some research, I came across a guy who translated it this way. He said, take no weird place of thinking about nothing. Now that's still complicated English. Take no weird place of thinking about nothing. Have you ever gotten in a bar bad place? Have you ever gotten in a dark place? It just feels like life was raining down on you and you were struggling to find hope. You were struggling to feel like there was a way ahead. You just felt like it was all crashing down on you. And you just kind of started thinking some pretty negative thoughts. You got into a dark place. I think that's what this is really about. This idea of you get into a weird place about thinking about life. And it feels so overwhelming. You feel like the walls are crashing in on you. And, and the Apostle Paul says, be careful of that place. Be careful of that place. And I think this adds a depth of understanding about, it's not just about being anxious, but it's about those dark places we get into. And those can be filled with anger. Those can be filled with jealousy. Those can be filled with a lot of emotions beyond just being anxious. So Paul, Paul is encouraging us, we can't stay there. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Have you ever been really angry with somebody? I have to raise my hand on that. All right. Uh, I know, as since I'm the boss at Midwestern, kind of, that I know there are times people get really angry with me. All right. And I can tell you that there are times that kids come to us very angry at their house parents because the house parent probably said no. They did their job really well, and it made the child angry. Okay, maybe you've experienced that in your household. All right, I was listening to the radio, and uh, somebody did a little spot with a, a mother who's posting a blog or something with a two-year-old, and that two-year-old was very angry because mom had said no to that two-year-old. Maybe you can envision that, all right? But a lot of times as we get into adulthood, and we have to play the adult game of life, the people that we're most angry with those are the people we just disassociate from. We actually don't have the conversation with them. We stay away. We play nice. We, because, you know, we want to be nice. We want to be loving. We want to be all that God's called us to. But, man, I'm angry with them right now. And maybe there's some wisdom even in the idea that if I had that conversation right now with you, I would say some not so nice things. And so maybe I shouldn't just have that conversation. But I want to tell you that is not the God we serve. We serve a God that when we're angry with him and we're frustrating with him, we can say what we need to say. We can have the conversation that, that we need to get us through and past those moments. But unfortunately, when we get angry at God, it's almost like that adult that we avoid. Sometimes those are the moments we pray the least. We don't bring it before. And so truly, as Philippians 4 this morning says, we need to pray it through. Um, I'm going to skip past something real quickly here, because that's a video that has no sound. Sorry about that. It's on me. All right. Um, but that video basically was, was a, an example of someone that had just lost their job and was angry with their boss, their Christian brother that fired them. It was angry at God for not delivering in a way that they thought that he should have delivered. And letting God know that. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Brothers and sisters, we have a God that's bigger than anything that we actually deal with here. And he is ready to hear. He is ready to, to understand. He is ready to know where we're at. He wants us to bring our requests before him. 
Uh, so when you don't feel like praying, tell God. That speaks loud to me. When I don't feel like praying, tell God about that. And it's amazing how that level of prayer breaks through to a different level when I actually go down that road. You know, we have prayerisms. Have you heard of the hedge of protection? You've ever prayed the hedge of protection around someone? All right. We have prayerisms that we go through. And I wonder what God does with that. You know, it says in the Bible that the, that the Holy Spirit is there with groans that only, only the Holy Spirit knows as we struggle to get our request before God. That he's translating that. Well, if I'm thanking God and praising God for this victory or this great thing happening or, uh, you know, the, the, the successes and victories of life, I have pretty good words around that. But when I'm dealing with loss, when I'm dealing with struggles, when I'm dealing with hurt, I don't always have the words for that. And I need to tell God anyways. We need to tell God anyways. We need to pray it through even when we don't feel like praying. We need to think it through. Um, sometimes we get in our own way of life, of our relationship with God. And I want to take you back real quickly. We won't, for the sake of time, we won't go back and read it. But uh, I want to take you back to the Apostle Paul. Before he was the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, and he was persecuting Christians. And from his world view, this Jesus guy was just causing problems. And his followers were really causing problems. And don't you know, as a good Jew, we need to defend the faith? And that God promised his blessings to Jews as long as they would defend the faith? And oh, how he probably knew the long history of Israel, that they would turn away from God and they would start living for idols and they would forget their God and they would forget the covenant God made with them. And Paul's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be zealous for God and I'm going to live for him. And there's a road to Damascus. And Paul's going to be said, going to be shown, going to be told by Jesus himself. Why are you persecuting me? And it's their larger moment where we think through things of, did God really say that the, what we're expecting was going to be the way it was going to happen? See, Paul in this Jewish mindset was thinking it's about the temple, it's about the covenant, it's about the old law, and he was standing firm in that. And then Jesus confronts him, and he has to deal with the Messiah the Messiah was just as represented in the Old Testament as all the things God or that Paul was, was prioritizing, and he missed it. And so there's the idea of, of, did God really promise this, or did God really promise that? And sometimes we hold on to promises that we believe that God really said, this is the way it's going to be. Like, I'll have this specific job for X amount of days. I'll never have hardship in my family or my marriage. God never promised that. God promised, have faith in Jesus, for Jesus overcame the world. That's what he promised. You can look at the Jerusalem crowd when they're screaming literally, crucify him, crucify him. And then just 40 days later at Pentecost, when Paul or when Peter and the apostles, I'm sorry, when Peter and the apostles are out talking about Jesus and how he was crucified to save them. And that crowd turns and on the very first day, 3,000 people were baptized. They went from a Jewish mindset to a godly mindset to where they could open their minds to a Messiah, to a Savior. Life has changes for that in us, that we really hold on to this and we think as long as we have this, we're okay. 
And maybe the stock market changes and we don't have as much money in the stock market anymore. Kind of happened to some of us in 2022, I think, right? And we go, hmm, did God promise a healthy IRA? Or did he promise he would be our deliverer no matter what? And we hold on to the wrong things and we get stressed about the wrong things. And we get angry at God. And sometimes we got to change our perspective. We got to change our walk. So we got to stay back and see what God actually promised that He's the way, the truth, the life. He is the answer. I would say we need to talk it through. When we're angry at each other, sometimes we have to bring in another person. We've got to go talk it through with somebody else before we can actually work it out with our brother or sister. And then we need to go work it out with our brother or sister. That's biblical. That's what Jesus shared on the Sermon on the Mount. But sometimes we need that extra help. Sometimes we need to talk it through with someone. Sometimes to get that perspective. Sometimes to get us back to where we can pray, we need to talk it through with one another. That's where we need each other. That's why God created the church, was that we could not have to go our walk alone. That's why we come every Sunday morning. And oh, I don't know about you, but what the, co- what the, what the shutdown of COVID taught me was, I need my brothers and sisters. And I need to be in the same room with them on Sunday mornings. And we got a huge lesson of life of what it meant that when we couldn't worship together, truly, in person, how that felt. And I'm thankful for virtual. I'm thinking for streaming. And if we're streaming this morning, I'm glad you're joining us. But we need each other. We don't need to walk this road alone. And when we're struggling with being angry with God, we need to be surrounded even more by our brothers and our sisters. And unfortunately, those are moments we might isolate ourselves even more from our brothers and our sisters. You see, Christ suffered alone so that we would never suffer alone. That's the power of his church. Christ suffered alone so that we would never suffer alone. But we got to open up. We got to share. I hope that's what's in this this church. I get to come about once a year, but it's hard for me to really know you at once a year. And if all I did was connect with my brothers and sisters once a year, I wouldn't have much of a connection. But we can walk in and out of the church building every Sunday morning and not connect not share, not be loved, not love. And if you're like where I am, and and my just every Sunday morning at the church I attend, it's too easy to talk to the same people. It's too easy to have the same conversations. Who's God calling you to talk to? Who's calling you to love on? There's hurt. There's a lot of hurt. We We need to be truly his hands and feet to not allow others to suffer alone. And that's what I know of you from a distance, but sometimes we get into bad habits. Sometimes we need a little reminder. Let's not let others suffer alone. And then I want to encourage you to praise it through. Psalms 108. Again, we're not going to read it because it's already 11 o'clock and you probably are thinking, hmm, what about lunch? I don't know. But real quickly, I want to encourage you to praise it through. Psalms 108, David gets, just says, I'm going to awaken the dawn with praise. He's up before the sun is up. And he's, I'm going to start this day with praise. Maybe he throws in a hallelujah. All right. What's he going to do that day? He's heading off for war. He's going to take his sword and his shield, and he's going to lead his army into a physical battle. And men are going to die. Men in his army, the enemy that he's fighting, war. And he starts out his day with, I'm going to raise a hallelujah. I'm going to praise God. And it's his psalm as he starts the day. That's Psalm 108. Sometimes we start the day knowing it's going to be a hard day. 
There's going to be some hard things today. Maybe we've got to go see the doctor and talk about cancer. Do we begin the day praising God? That's hard. That's a hard perspective to be. Maybe we know that something's about to change. And we don't want to deal with that change. And do we start that day praising it through? There's a song out there uh, written in the Christian, Christian music world called I Raise a Hallelujah. And it's a story about a family that had a young, a young man. They had just decorated for Christmas. They were getting excited about Christmas. And all of a sudden that young man just, is just laying there kind of half unconscious on the floor. They didn't know what happened. They rushed him to the hospital. And he's just getting worse and worse and worse. And they're praying and they're praying and they're praying. And they said, I just ran out of words to pray. It was a long struggle. And they talk about there was a night where they were going to have to to, to put a tube down him. And they really thought he's not going to survive this. But he's not going to survive it if we don't. And so they prepared the parents for it. They took on the risk. They understood. And they sent out the word to their, to their team. This is a bad night. We don't know if he's going to survive tonight. And some people who were good musically said this song came out. I raise a, ha- I raise a hallelujah. There is an acapella version of it. We get to sing it every now and then at our church. Uh, in the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah. That we start with that idea of praising God. We praise God through it. And we praise God afterwards. And in the story of that young man, God delivered. And I almost hate to bring up that story because... We know that sometimes we're in a fight. We're in a fight with a health issue. We're in a fight with whatever issue. And for whatever reason, God does not answer. In the way of making, having that child live, that person live, that it's followed up with the funeral. But I will tell you, whatever God does in his infinite wisdom, we need to praise our way through it. That uplifts God. That uplifts our soul And that's the most challenging thing we can do. Because I read verse 4 before I got to verse 6. Did you hear verse 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. I didn't make this up. I'm just trying to follow where Paul is leading us. That we get in those dark places. We get in those struggles. We're angry at God. We need to pray it through. We need to get the right perspective and think it through. We need to talk it through. We need to praise it through. That's what we need to do when we're angry at God. I went too far. Brothers and sisters, this is not an easy lesson. This is a lesson that when I'm in these dark places, I struggle. And if you're in a dark place this morning, I understand why the struggle is there for you. And I just want to give you the hope and the encouragement that God is with you. God is standing beside you, and God is loving you through it. No no height, nor depth, nor anything can separate us from the love of God. And that's the encouragement that I have for you. That whether you're walking in times of plenty or in times of want, God is your deliverer. God is your Savior. This morning, just an opportunity. I'm sure the elders will pray with you, or Mark, or I'll pray with you. If you have any need, you need just someone to join you in the prayer, to not stand it alone anymore. It's an opportunity while we stand and sing. And if you've never taken on the Lord Jesus in baptism to make him your Lord and Savior, then this is an opportunity this morning to no longer walk alone but to put Christ on as your Lord and Savior, to put that old person to death and come up a new person in Christ, filled with victory and hope. If you have any need, please come as we stand and sing. Bring Christ your-